Good evening, and welcome to our TV show featuring documentaries revealing the realities behind myths using research and scholarship. I'm your host, Ergun Kırlıkovalı, and I will be with you every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're welcome to send me your feedback at hashtag ethocide. Repeat, hashtag ethocide. Dictionary.com defines myth in part as follows. An unproved or false collective belief that is used to justify a social institution. In our case, the social institution would be public education. Some of the adjectives associated with the word myth are fake, fiction, fantasy, hoax, fairy tale, fallacy, urban legend, fabrication, hearsay, among others. Today, I would like to focus on three persistent falsehoods that constitute the three pillars of the Armenian narrative, misrepresenting the events of World War I. Give a lie 24 hours start, and it will take a hundred years to overtake it. This is a famous quote by the British C.F. Dixon Johns, the author of the 1916 book, The Armenians. Dixon Johns was appalled over the deceitful practices of the Armenians. After more than a century, Armenians, unfortunately, are still at it today. Let us expose some of those fabrications here to, to the extent possible within the limits of this program. A partial list of the Armenian forged documents would have to include that infamous pyramid of skulls with buzzards flying over, implying that they belong to the Armenian victims of the systematic extermination campaign by Turks in 1915. This image was used by Armenians in so many documentaries, books, articles, posters, invitations, and events. It actually has nothing to do with Armenians. Professor Turkaya Atev, like a good history detective, tracked it to an 1872 painting called Apotheosis of War, or in simple English, The Climax of War, satirizing the 1871 Franco-Prussian War. That oil painting still hangs in the Tretyakov Gallery in Moscow today. The Armenian forgeries list would have to have the contain and the altered photo of the father of Turkey, Ataturk, posing with puppies. Armenians deceitfully photoshopped the puppies out of the photo and replaced them with supposed severed heads of Armenian victims. Then there is that bogus quote attributed to Hitler which was exposed by Professor Heath Laurie in his white paper titled The United States Congress and Adolf Hitler on the Armenians. Political Communication and Persuasion 3, 1985, starting at page 123. I covered this issue in episode 2. Another notorious sham would be that altered photo with the caption a Turkish official taunting starving Armenians with bread. In The Great Game of Genocide, a book by Donald Bloxham, Oxford University Press, 2005. Oxford University and a sham. Professor Turk Turkaya Atöv covered most, if not all, of the major Armenian fabrications in his book titled Armenian Falsifications published by OK Enterprises, Inc., New York, in 2008. But perhaps the most important three myths in the Armenian narrative, or the three pillars, as Professor Gunter Louis put it in his essay titled Revisiting the Armenian Genocide, Middle East Quarterly, Fall 2005, would be the 1920 Istanbul Courts Martial, the role of the special organization, and 
the memoirs of Naim Bey. Here's what the Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Gunther Louis, wrote. Most of those who maintain that Armenian deaths were premeditated and so constitute genocide based their argument on three pillars. One, the actions of the Turkish military courts of 1919 and 1920, which convicted officials of the young Turk government in absentia of organizing massacres of Armenians. Two, the role of the so-called special organization or Teşkilat-ı Mahsusa in Ottoman Turkish, accused of carrying out massacres. And three, the infamous memoirs of Naim Bey, which contain alleged telegrams of Interior Minister Talat Pasha, conveying the orders of destruction of the Armenians which I covered in episode three. Yet, when these events and the sources describing them are subjected to careful examination, they provide at most a shaky foundation from which to claim, let alone conclude, that the, the, the deaths of Armenians were premeditated. Professor Louis goes on to explain the aspects of the first pillar, Turkish courts martial of 1919 and 1920, as follows. Following the Ottoman Empire's defeat in World War I, a new government formed and accused its predecessor, young Turk regime, of serious crimes. These accusations led to the court martialing of the leadership of the Committee on Union and Progress, the party that had seized and held power since 1908, and other selected former officials. The charges included subversion of the Constitution, wartime profiteering, and the massacres of both Greeks and Armenians. The chief reason for convening military tribunals was pressure from victorious allies, which insisted on retributions for the Armenian massacres. The Turks also hoped that by foisting blame on a few members of the Committee on Union and Progress, they might exculpate the rest of the Turkish nation and thereby receive more lenient treatment at the Paris Peace Conference. At least six regional courts, Yozgat, Harput, and Trabzon among them, convened in provincial cities where massacres had occurred. But due to inadequate documentation, the total number of courts is not known. The first recorded tribunal began on February 5, 1919, in Yozgat, charging three Turkish officials with mass murder. On April 9th, the tribunal found two defendants guilty. Two days after they passed the verdict, local authorities hanged Mehmet Kemal, the former Kaimakam or governor of Boazlian and Yozgat. A large demonstration followed his funeral. The British High Commissioner in Turkey reported the popular perception, quote, regarded executions as necessary concessions to entente rather than as punishment justly meted out to criminals. The main trial in Istanbul on April 28, 1919, among the 12 defendants were members of the Committee on Union and Progress leadership and former ministers. Seven key figures, including Talat Pasha, Minister of Interior, Enver Pasha, Minister of War, and Jamal Pasha, Governor of Aleppo, had fled and therefore were tried in absentia. 
on July 22, the court martial found several defendants guilty of subverting constitutionalism by force and found them responsible for massacres. Talat Enver Jamal and Nazim Bey, a high commi committee on Union Progress official, were sentenced in absentia to death, while others received lengthy prison sentences. Under the leadership of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, a highly decorated Turkish official and officer, a nationalist movement emerged that would eventually overthrow the Sultan's government in Istanbul. On August 11, 1920, the Kemalist govern government in Ankara ordered a stop to all court martial proceedings. The resignation of the last Ottoman cabinet on October 17, 1920, marked the end of the trials. The Armenian writers have praised the contribution of the military tribunals for their elucidation of historical truth. But such broad in conclusions are problematic given both the procedures of the trials and questions over the reliability of their findings. Throughout the trials, the court heard no witnesses and the verdict rested entirely on documents and testimony never subject to cross-examination. Contemporary Turkish authors dismiss the military tribunals of 1919 and 1920 as tools of allied retribution. At the time, the victorious allies considered them a travesty of justice. The trials, British High Commissioner Calthorpe wrote to London, are, quote, proving to be a farce and injurious to our own prestige and, that, and to that of the Turkish government." Unquote. In the view of Commissioner Robeck, the tribunal was such a failure that its findings cannot be held of any account at all. When the British government considered holding trials of alleged Ottoman war criminals in Malta, it declined to use any evidence developed by the 1919-1920 Ottoman tribunals. As for the second pillar, Lewis states in the same article that several of the courts martial held in 1919-1920 made references to the destructive role of a unit called Teşkilatı Mahsusa or special organization. Many proponents of the Armenian cause accept this accusation. One such Armenian even described the members of this unit as the main instrument used by the Committee on Union and Progress to carry out its plan to exterminate the Armenians. Their mission was to deploy in remote areas of Turkey's interior and to ambush and destroy convoys of Armenian deportees. The special organization's principal duty was the execution of the Armenian genocide. That's according to the Armenians. The special organization, which developed between 1903 and 1907, only adopted its name in 1913. Under the direction of Enver Pasha and the command of many talented officers, the special organization functioned like a special forces outfit. Philip Studdard, the American author of the only full scholarly study of the group, called it a significant unionist vehicle for dealing with both Arab separatism and Western imperialism. At its peak, it enrolled about 30,000 men. During World War I, the Ottoman command used it for special military operations in the Caucasus, Egypt, and Mesopotamia. In 1915, for example, 
special organization units, units seized key oases along the Ottoman line of advance against the Suez Canal. The regime also used the special organization to suppress subversion and possible collaboration with the external enemy. However, according to Stoddard, this activity targeted primarily indigenous nationalists in Syria and Lebanon. The special organization, he maintained, played no role in the Armenian deportations. None. While the Ottoman government released convicts during World War I in order to increase its manpower pool for military service, there is no evidence beyond the indictment of the main trial for the assertion that the special organization, with large numbers of convicts enrolled in its ranks, took the lead role in the massacres. Nor was the presence of convicts abnormal. Use of convicts for military duty in wartime had precedent, including the US and British armies. During World War I, for example, the U.S. courts released almost 8,000 men convicted of serious offenses on condition of their induction into military service. Many of the allegations linking the special organization to massacres are based not directly on documents, but rather on sometimes questionable assumptions of those reading them. One Armenian writer makes assertions for which the original sources do not allow. He described the link between the special organization and the Armenian massacres, but Stenge, the German officer who wrote the document, never actually mentioned the special organization, but instead referred to scum and the Armenian writer took the leap. Nor is there any indication that Stange had any role in the special organization, as the Armenian writer asserted. Gwyn Dyer, one of the few Western scholars to have done research in the Ottoman military archives, has characterized the, as gossip the assertion that the special organization was complicit in the Armenian massacres gossip. The archive of the Turkish general staff is said to contain ciphered telegrams to this special organization, but these documents have not been subjected to scholarly inquiry yet. Until new documents emerge, and a link between the special organization and the Armenian massacre is nothing but uncorroborated assertion uncorroborated assertion. Finally, the third pillar upon which the charge of Armenian genocide rests is Aram Andonian's book called Memoirs of Naim Bey. Aram Andonian was an Ottoman Armenian employed as a military censor at the time of mobilization in 1914. After his April 1915 arrest and deportation from Istanbul, he made his way to Aleppo, where he obtained a permit for temporary residence. There he made contact with a Turkish official named Naim Bey, who handed over to Andonian his memoirs, which contained a large number of official documents, telegrams, and decrees, which Naim Bey stated had passed through Naim Bey's hands during his term in office. Andonian translated these memoirs into Armenian. They were published in Armenian, French, and English editions. The documents reproduced in Naim Bey's memoirs are the most damning evidence put forward to support the claim of genocide. Particularly incriminating are the telegrams of the wartime interior minister, Talat Pasha. There are many doubts as to the authenticity 
of the documents reproduced in nine base memoirs. Several Armenian scholars suggest that a German court authenticated five of these Talat Pasha telegrams during the 1921 trial of Sogomon Tehlirian, who assassinated Talat Pasha in Berlin on March 15, 1921. However, the stenographic record of the trial, published in 1921, shows that Defense Counsel von Garden, von Gordon withdrew his motion to introduce the five telegrams into evidence before their authenticity could be verified. Two Turkish authors, Shinasi Orel and Süreyya Yuja, who undertook a detailed examination of the authenticity of the documents in the Andonian volume, suggest that the Armenians may have purposely destroyed the originals in order to avoid the chance that one day the superiorness, the superiorness of the documents would be revealed. Orel and Yuja argue that discrepancies between authentic Turkish documents and those reproduced in Naim Andonian book suggest the latter to be crude forgeries. In addition, the two authors could find no reference to Naim Bey in official registers and cast doubt on his very existence. When the memoirs were published in 1920, Armenian activists described Aram Andonian, sorry, Naim Bey, as an honest individual driven to make amends for his misdeeds. But according to a letter composed by Andonian in 1937, Naim Bey was addicted to alcohol and gambling, and the documents he provided were bought for money. To have unveiled the truth about Naim Bey, Antonian wrote, would have served no purpose, no, no purpose. More likely, it would have undercut the very effectiveness of the memoirs. Nobody would believe, would have believed, the word of an alcoholic and gambler who might have manufactured the documents to obtain money. So he let the lie stand. Turkish authors are not alone in their assessment that the Naim Andonian documents are fakes. Dutch historian Erik Zürcher, writing in 1997, argued that the Andonian materials have been shown to be forgeries. British historian Andrew Mango speaks of telegrams dubiously attributed to the Ottoman wartime minister of the interior, Talat Pasha. It is ironic that lobbyists and policymakers seek to base a determination of genocide upon documents most historians and scholars dismiss at, to, at, to, at worst as forgeries and at best as unverifiable and problematic. In conclusion, Louis states that, quote, the three pillars of the Armenian claim to classify World War I deaths as genocide fail to substantiate the charge that the Young Turk regime intentionally organized the massacres. Other alleged evidence for a premeditated plan of annihilation, annihilation fares no better. For more information, you're welcome to visit meforum.org tolarmeniantale.com and armenians-1915.blogspot.com, among many others. So, nine base memoirs, fake. Special organization connection, fabricated. 1919-1920 courts martial, a kangaroo court. Where do we go from here? Well, that's another discussion for another time. Thank you for joining me. See you next week.